name of our loving, liberating, life-giving God. Amen. Peace. Coming to St. Michael and All Angels for at least one member of my family has been an invitation to broaden the imagination. You see, our son is about to turn six years old, and all around this church are statues and icons and even stained glass windows of that old Archangel Michael. And the angel was hardly ever what caught Silas's attention. Rather, what tends to draw his eye is the dragon. <laughs> Silas has so many questions about the dragon, what it means, where Michael encountered the dragon, why they fought. And the dragon needs explanation. So today I want to talk about the dragon. And I do so with a bit of trepidation. Episcopalians don't often talk about evil and sin. We live in days where faith can be difficult. There's a great deal of cynicism in our society. Some of it parades as atheism. And those of us who come to church who say our prayers are questioned. Why bother? Don't we know that science is real? Isn't this all just a big fairy tale? Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. Those words are actually a misquote by the fantasy author Neil Gaiman of G.K. Chesterton. He used what he thought were Chesterton's word to start his novel Coraline. And the misquote was so good that it stuck around. Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. I feel within myself, even as I say those words, as I contemplate preaching this sermon around the dragon and evil, a certain resistance. I was raised a good Episcopalian. Evil is difficult to talk about, and this is in part, I think, at least because the church has often used the questions of good and evil to belittle, to manipulate, and to control. The church has called many things evil, which are good, from loving same-gender relationships to ordained women to the acceptance of our trans siblings and the welcoming of immigrants. The church has been wrong to name what is good as evil. And for the times the church has done so out of a desire for power, we must repent. And so I can understand why it would be tempting in church, in a church like this one, where many of us bear some wounds from being labeled or knowing the labels, why it would be tempting to avoid the dragons altogether, to avoid evil. And there is another dimension to our denial of evil. I think it's less psychological and more philosophical. We live in a world of binaries. All around us, computers are talking in code. Even in our pockets, a series of calculations is being made in ones and zeros. We have built a world on binaries. And in a binary world, something either is or it isn't. In that sort of worldview, it might be tempting to see evil simply as the absence of good, in the way that darkness is the absence of light. Well, the Orthodox theologian Alexander Schmemann wrote against such a binary understanding when it comes to evil, writing about why our baptismal liturgy asks the person to be baptized or the parents and godparents speaking on their behalf to renounce Satan and all his works. It's a tough question to ask in front of a little baby, isn't it? Why do we do it? Shmeiman says this, evil is most emphatically not a mere absence. It is precisely a presence, the presence of something dark, irrational, and very real. Although the origin of that presence may not be clear and immediately understandable, thus hatred is not simply an absence of love. 
It is the presence of a dark power which can indeed be extremely active, clever, even creative. And it is certainly not the result of ignorance. We may know and hate. Shmeiman names evil in such a way, but says that the church has never had a precise doctrine of the devil. We don't know the devil intellectually, but we know him when we see him. We know that evil is real and must be named. We're living through a season when many of us could name the demons around us. Let me try out some names of demons that I have seen. Greed, sexism, homophobia, classism, ethnocentrism. Any of those familiar? I would argue that racism is one of the most powerful demonic forces out there, one of the most persistent in this country. You know that line from The Usual Suspects, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist? That is how I feel when I hear someone say, well, but I'm not a racist. The demon is present. A few years ago, I was up in New York City with my dad. It was a strangely warm December night, and we had had dinner, and we were on a street corner waiting for a cab. And this was before the days of Uber and Lyft when my phone would have told me when the cab was coming, right? We finally hailed a taxi, but we'd been waiting behind somebody else, and so we tried to give him the cab. As the man reached for the door, the cabbie sped off. The man to whom we had tried to pass the cab was black. And I stood on that corner waiting for another taxi, and I was just stewing in my righteous anger. But then, as I was stewing, I thought about a moment that had happened just earlier that week. I was living at the time in Washington, D.C., and I'd been stopped up in Columbia Heights at a traffic light. And on the sidewalk next to me was a group of African-American teenagers. Without thinking about it, I had hit the lock button on my car, and the teenagers heard the thunk. One of them winced, and I thought, it's not just the New York cabbies. I think that racism, that old demon, grabs a hold of all human beings sometimes. Now we have come a long way as a society, but to fool ourselves into thinking that racism is over or that homophobia is a thing of the past, that misogyny is a remnant of less enlightened times, is to allow the demons to run unchecked in our society and, importantly, in ourselves. As Christians, we cannot pretend to name evil in others when we are unwilling or unable to recognize when it acts through us. So, do I think that there is a sort of supernatural power in these evils? Honestly, on this Michaelmas, I do. I can't find any other satisfactory explanation for why human beings would treat one another the way we seem to treat one another in our society. Faith is an exercise in imagination. Faith asks us to engage our imaginations, to see what can't be seen with our eyes on their own, to ponder the hidden realities, even when those realities are ugly and cruel, even when in our own anger, it's, it's our own anger we must understand. Faith invites us to name the dragons so that they might be vanquished. So there's another part of the image of St. Michael that immediately catches my son's attention. And the dragon always comes first, but right behind it, right behind the questions of the dragons, he tends to notice the sword. And, and how could you not, right? And especially in the stained glass window back there, look at it on your way out, it's a fiery sword. It's like a lightsaber, it's great. And I'm convinced that we're asked to exercise our imaginations when it comes to supernatural good as well. That there is power out there for supernatural good. Yes, I believe human beings can come under the influence of evil, 
but I've also seen evidence of people who are possessed by what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. I'm convinced that in spite of the cynicism in our day, that God is out there actively working. And the best name that I know for the supernatural power of God is love. And I have the privilege of seeing God's love at work in the world every week through people of faith. I see the power of love at work each Tuesday morning when more than a dozen volunteers show up in the early morning here to feed about 200 households. And at the food pantry, alongside the nutrition, there are hugs and smiles and laughter. There's always laughter. And I see the love of God at work in the groups that drive supplies down to the border shelters in El Paso on the first Wednesday of every month. I see God's love on Thursday morning in the stillness that is offered in this space by a dedicated group of contemplatives, quiet room in a busy and loud world. I see the love of God in the friends who show up to make food for people who are sick, to bring hugs and prayers to a family who has just experienced a death. I saw the love of God this year, the righteous, possessing love of God in every person who showed up at the Roundhouse in Santa Fe or who waited through an hours-long Albuquerque City Council meeting to advocate for immigrant neighbors. God's love has the power to take hold, and it does so time and again in this church. And I'm just privileged to witness that love at work through you. Seeing God's love in action here is like watching a fiery sword that cuts through all the negativity, the frustration, the hatred, the grossness that is too present in the news each day. Today, we tell the story again of Michael defeating the dragon. Today, we hear the story to remind us that angels are stronger than demons, that love is more powerful than hate. If you want to know this is true, if you want to know it is true in your bones, I encourage you to do two things in response to this story today. Both of them are different ways of investing. First, I would invite you to stick around after the service for the ministry fair. Get to know some of the volunteers. Sign up to join in the work of this parish. Weave yourself more fully into this community. If you invest your time and talent, you too will see angels at work. I would also invite you to consider how you support the work of St. Michael's in the year ahead financially. We are in the midst of our annual pledge drive. All of the work we are able to do in this place is empowered by the generosity of this congregation. Money in the Episcopal Church does not trickle down from on high. Without your generosity, St. Michael's would not exist. If you have already made a pledge, thank you. If you are still considering your pledge, I would invite you to talk to one of the members of our stewardship team. They're out there in the narthex with the videos. We'll be premiering videos starting today of different people talking about what this place means to them. But challenge yourself to put your money where your values are. Make a difference with us. We live in difficult, cynical days. These are not easy days to be people of faith. But your faith matters. Your faith matters because it is through the eyes of faith that we can see and name the evil in the world. I know that many of us are facing the coming month with trepidation. As the election season wraps up, we see evil rearing its ugly head. We see the demonic forces of hatred all around. And it may seem strange to say it, but I would submit to you that while voting is important, while the election matters, the fate of our society won't be determined on November 5th. No matter what happens on election day, the dragons won't all be vanquished. Poverty and hunger, inequity will persist. 
So whatever happens this November, the fight that continues is a fight that has gone on throughout human history. Is it, a, it is a fight that goes on throughout the cosmos itself. Goodness must always contend with evil. Love must always stand up to hate. Whatever happens in November, our work here remains the same. We will witness to the love of God. Whatever happens, St. Michael's will stand on the side of the better angels of our nature. No matter what happens, here at St. Michael's, we will seek to know and to make known what is always true. Dragons can be beaten because love's, God's love is always more powerful than hate. Amen.